Hi students, welcome to HSC Earth and Environmental Science and Module 5, Earth's Processes. This is video 14. We're going to have a little bit of a look at index fossils and their relationship to the geological time scale. So what we want you to be able to do is to discuss the significance of index fossils in generating a geological time scale. So in order to do this, we need to be able to describe what index fossils are to link the importance of index fossils to the production of a geological time scale and then hopefully to be able to solve some problems using this geological time scale. So one of the most important things that we need to be able to do is to date fossils. When we start to look Look at the fossil record we notice that there are certain types of fossils that are sort of clustered together at different in different rock types and also in what appear to be different ages but in order to actually put a, a chronology a geo chronology together to try and work out time frames for each of these different fossils we needed to have some sort of system we needed to have some way of trying to work out how old different fossils were, what sort of organisms were likely to have occurred at the same time, that is living in a similar area or at least living on the earth at a similar time, and how we might go about um, putting new finds uh, into our existing knowledge. And of course, this has happened all the time as we've continued to explore the earth, as we've continued to uncover new fossils, we've had to determine where they fit in to our current knowledge about the history of life on Earth. And there's a couple of important methods that we've already talked about a little bit um, to give us a clue as to how this might work. The first of these, uh, in no particular order of course, is absolute dating. And absolute dating is about using radioactive material that's present uh, either in the living things, if they've been uh, carbonized, for example, or in um, rocks that surround the fossils, so igneous intrusions in particular, where there may be particular types of radioisotopes that we're aware of that have a certain period of time over which they decay into more stable isotopes. And if we know what those are, and we can collect uh, samples that are not contaminated in any way, then we can get a bit of an idea about those types of uh, ages for those particular samples. Sometimes we can use a combination of an understanding of some absolute dating to help us solve some problems using relative dating. Now relative dating of course doesn't have the same uh, precision around uh, ages as absolute dating but it does give us a little bit of an idea of sequences. So in order to apply our understanding to relative dating, we need to know about things like stratigraphic correlation. We need to know about the principle of uniformitarianism and also the principle of superposition. And these start to give us a little bit of an idea together at how each of these sorts of principles can be applied to help us to date fossils. Sometimes it might be possible to use bracketing. Now bracketing occurs where you have uh, similar fossils where there is some sort of an overlap in time. So if you know that your particular assemblage um, uses one particular fossil from one time period and another particular fossil from another time period, then you know that the um, age of your rock must be in that overlapping time zone. So that can be another way that we can use uh, our understanding of where fossils occur uh, to get a little bit more of a, a narrower idea of the range, age range for a particular rock or a particular fossil. As we've alluded to at the beginning of this particular video, one of the things we're most interested in is index fossils. Now, of course, we need to have a little bit more of an understanding of index fossils before we start to talk about them. But in very general terms, for example, if we find dinosaurs, we know that we are narrowing down the age of the rock in which they can be found. There's certainly rocks that are very young, which we don't find any dinosaur bones in. And there's also rocks that are very old that we don't find any dinosaur bones in. So the fact that we've identified something as a fossil from a dinosaur does narrow the range. Now, it would be good if we could narrow the range really tightly so we could have certain types of fossils where if we find those particular fossils, we know that we don't just have a kind of general period of time, but we have a really specific period of time 
uh, over the history of the Earth that we're looking at. And that's one of the things that we want to try and do with our use of index fossils. But as I said, if we're going to um, try and understand this whole application of relative dating in particular, then we need to look at some of the important paleontological principles. So really, these are geological principles, but we're applying them specifically to our study of paleontology, that is, the study of fossils from past life. So as I mentioned, one of the most important principles that we apply is the principle of uniformitarianism. And this principle is basically saying that the processes that we can see in the present are the same as they were in the past. And that um, includes things like how much time they take, the speed at which certain things occur, um, is not something that is um, speeding up as we go forward in time or slowing down as we go forward in time, but we're assuming uniform uh, practice uniform time frames, uniform uh, processes, so that what we see happening uh, is the same no matter what period of time we're looking at. The second principle we need to look at is superposition. And superposition assumes that rocks that are uh, horizontally laid down are laid oldest first and then younger and younger, so that the youngest rocks would be at the top of a sequence. Now, assuming that there's been no um, alteration, that these haven't been flipped over at some point previously. This is a very important principle that we use um, to apply when we're looking at fossils, so that we can assume that the oldest fossils are further down in a rock sequence than the younger fossils. And so that also can tell us something about where we should find certain types of fossils. Of course, if we have uh, more than one group of rocks, and then more than one group of fossils in those rocks, then we may actually be able to, to apply the principle of stratigraphic correlation. So strata are just layers. So stratigraphic correlation is looking at different layers and seeing if you can draw lines between them. Obviously, the way that this particular um, sample has been coloured makes it nice and easy for you to say rocks on one side are... Uh, of the same age as rocks of the other side. And that's because they're all part of this kind of continuous sequence. You can see a little bit of erosion that's happened in that central uh, valley. But sometimes rocks are not kind of as nice and easy as this. So what we're looking for are similar fossils, so fossils of similar organisms that are found in similar rock types. So we're talking about are they found in the same type of sandstone or shale? Um, we're not just talking about sedimentary. We want to try and get as specific as we can about the certain types of rocks and the certain types of fossils. Because if we can find a certain type of fossil in a certain type of rock and we find those rocks in different places, especially if we look at the rocks that are younger towards the top and older towards the bottom, sometimes we can actually see through um, multiple layers that we can correlate layers from one sequence to those of another sequence and say these must be of a similar age. Now they don't all have to be um, horizontally lined up like the ones in the diagram uh, on this slide are. They can be um, in all sorts of different orientations, but if the layering order is similar, the types of rocks are similar, and the fossils that are in them are similar, then this is a really gives us good confidence to think that we've been able to draw a comparison between fossils in one place and where they occur in another place. We can also apply absolute dating to our study of ages for different types of fossils. Sometimes the material that's in the fossil themselves can actually be used for uh, dating, depending on the types. If it's carbon, often carbon has an age uh, range, a limit beyond which we can't use uh, carbon dating, but other types of isotopes may be present that may allow us to um, be able to age the fossils directly. But we can also use things like the principle of cross-cutting, that is igneous intrusions that have cut through different layers of rock, which we can assume are therefore younger than the rocks that they've cut through. Sometimes there may be a volcanic layer that may be laid down at the top of a sequence and then other layers subsequently um, of sedimentary rock have been laid on top. And so maybe what we can do is we can uh, age one or two of the rocks in the center or at various levels in the sequence. Um, and by say, aging two rocks that are igneous, we might be able to get a little bit of an idea and narrow down our range for a particular type of 
uh, fossiliferous layer. But what's really nice is if we can use index fossils. Um, while we've talked generally, I've talked generally about things like uh, dinosaur fossils, giving you a bit of an idea about a Mesozoic age. What we can do with index fossils is to get much more specific in terms of our geological time scale. There are a couple of important characteristics of index fossils. They firstly need to be easily identified. We don't need to be spending lots and lots of time trying to work out exactly which species we've got, exactly which type of organism we've got, because that's not going to be very helpful to us if we're going to try and use these as index fossils. Now they need to be geographically widespread, so we need to be able to find them in lots of different locations. So if they only occur in one type of rocks that we find in the Antarctic, that's not going to be particularly helpful to us as an index fossil. We want to be able to find the same organism that's, that's obviously fairly ubiquitous, it's lived in lots of different um, environments uh, where they've been able to survive and to leave traces uh, in the fossil record. And we need them in lots of different places if possible. But while we want them widespread geographically, we want them limited geologically. That is, we want them to appear in the fossil record and then disappear or become extinct over a very short time frame. So we only want these fossils to exist for a very short period in the geological timescale. Obviously, if they run through a large uh, number of periods, they're not going to be useful as index fossils because when you get them, you don't know if they're from the Cretaceous or from the Permian or from the Devonian. That's not useful as an index fossil. What you want to be able to do is to find something that allows you to narrow down the choice of the age as specifically as you possibly can. This diagram from your uh, textbook, Earth and Environmental Science in Focus, it gives you a good idea of some of the different types of organisms. They're not all trilobites, they're not all brachiopods, they're not all ammonites. There's a range of different types of organisms in different types of areas that have existed uh, in an easily identifiable form from their fossils over a geographically wide distribution and over a very short geological time frame, which qualifies them as index fossils. And of course, these are very useful if you're building a model because these particular fossils will then characterize a particular layer of rock as of a particular age. And that is what makes index fossils so useful when we're putting together a geological time scale. And here it is. This is the one that you're going to get in your HSC. My suggestion is that you get a copy, print it out, laminate it. Um, I'm actually gonna hand some of these out to you guys um, this coming week so that you've always got it. It's one of those things that should be sitting on your uh, table or your desk, wherever you do your study, every time you're doing questions uh, on earth and environmental science. It's one of these fantastic tools. It's like um, knowing how to use your calculator in maths. You can take it in. If you don't know how to, what buttons to press, or if you don't know what to do with that calculator, then it's not much use. You know you're gonna get this. So A, we don't try and memorize everything because it's going to be given to us. But what we do um, wanna make sure we, we have learned is how to use this particular tool. We want to know what information that it gives us. Maybe we want to be able to identify one or two um, of the specifically important index fossils that maybe we might want to scribble on this at the start to help us organize our thoughts and also to help cover any questions that we might get later on. So this is going to be a really important tool that we're going to be look at to make sure that we can uh, get the most out of this particular tool that you know you're going to get. Not something you need to memorize, but something you need to be able to use efficiently and effect. So here's a little bit of an overview on the relationship between index fossils and the geological time scale. And what we'll be doing next time is seeing if we can apply some of these ideas to a specific look at the Cambrian fauna. Thanks for watching.